Um, so yeah, hopefully this goes smoothly and, and we can uh, uh, get through a full lecture. If not, um, I'll keep lecturing to myself and, and post it up on YouTube. Um, okay, so uh, I hope everybody had a good uh, exam period and perhaps uh, you, you got a few days off to enjoy the weather. Um, maybe lights and fireworks, I don't know. Um, so uh, yeah, it feels like it's been forever. It's been three weeks. Or this is the third week. Ah uh, yes, so um, so the new course coordinator, um, so Lars is is uh, stepping down. He's going to be uh, sort of gradually stepping down. So he'll be still answering your questions for the next week. But uh, Sean Benjamin's going to take over uh, for him. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything right now, Sean, or or if you're. Um, but from here on out, it'll be Sean Benjamin. He'll be the course coordinator, and. Uh, and so he'll be, uh, you know, your sort of, your first, your first line of interaction is the TAs when it comes to course material. And then uh, next is Sean and, um, yeah, and then me. <clears throat> okay, yeah, uh, sure, you can introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Benjamin. I will be the new course coordinator. Uh, so everything you're learning here is everything I do in my research. You may not realize it. You may think, oh, it's just math. But if you are interested in data science, if you're interested in artificial intelligence, reinforcement learning, anything along those lines, this is essential. 1805 is essential. So, uh, you know, so in your Discord, you're welcome to ask me some questions and I can tell you uh, where some of this material is relevant within, uh, you know, for future re research and also future jobs. I mean, not everybody here is going to be academic, but uh, everybody's going to eventually get a job, be it academic or out in um, out in industry. So that's all I have to say. Okay, great. Yeah. So I've worked with Sean. Uh, well, we've we've known each other for a long time, and he's he's a very good guy. So uh, uh, yeah, uh, this should be good. Um, okay. So a few things to cover. Um, yeah. I, w I was his TA, although he was uh, so useful as a student, it was like another TA was there. So, um, all right, let's talk about uh, our schedule, where we are in the schedule. Um, so it's a big week, I guess, because there's a quiz. So uh, hopefully uh, you're all aware of the quiz um, and are prepared and, and you have until uh, Wednesday at midnight to write it. And it should be open right now. And it's a little bit different from the other quizzes where the other quizzes were uh, multiple choice. This one uh, is uh, essay style. Um, and you can, and then maybe are even encouraged to write your answers out clearly and then take a picture and upload them. That's probably the easiest thing for you to do. Um, but if you prefer, you can type them into uh, see you learn as well. Um, and there's uh, equation editors and stuff. So. Um, and, so, and it's basically, if you're prepared uh, by doing the practice quiz, uh, you should do fine on the actual quiz. Um, all right, so let's, uh, I'm gonna share my, my screen here. Let's look at the calendar. <clears throat> okay, so we are, and there's my reminder that, uh, sorry, just give me one sec, I have to configure my pen. Doesn't matter what uh, what computer or what operating system you you use. There's always some little bug that you need to work around for. So mine is the eraser doesn't always work. Um, okay, so we are here, uh, week nine. Uh, this is our lecture, uh, July sixth. So we're gonna do uh, graph theory and some asymptotic analysis. I'm not sure how much of this we'll get through. Um, well, we'll get through all of the graph theory and then some of the asymptotic analysis. Um, next week, uh, assignment three is due. And of course, you guys uh, should have gotten your marks for assignment two. Um, so there's sort of, uh, we're at this intersection of a lot of things right now. Um, are there any questions on either the practice quiz, uh, assignment two or assignment three? If there are, just shoot them out in the chat. All right, 
Well, that's good then. Um, uh, then we will uh, get on with the lecture. Um, so three weeks ago, we were talking a little bit about graph theory. Um, I'm going to, uh, first of all, let me share the proper screen. Okay. Now again, so I'm using uh, OneNote here instead of, uh, sometimes I use the slides. It depends on how expressive I need my answers to be. So OneNote's a more dynamic environment, so this allows me to play with the graphs a lot more. Um, most of this will be on the slides. Um, and I had a little trouble uh, printing this off to PDF. I have some bug, I'm not sure what it is. Um, uh, as soon as I can get that fixed, I'll have this uploaded on CU Learn. Right now, there's the slides that this is based off of are, are up there. So if you're trying to follow along, it's not going to be an exact match. But um, you know, the, all the subject matter is the same. This the but this will have a, a few more details. Okay, so last week, I guess this would have been uh, actually three weeks ago. Here, let me actually stop my video. Okay, so last week we talked about, uh, or the last lecture, we talked about center operations and identities. Um, and this was very similar, if you recall, to, uh, this is very similar to logic expressions. And we went over a little bit why, because you can use set builder notation and use these logical predicates to sort of build these sets. So when you have these membership tables, um, these are very similar to, you know, truth tables. And the set identities are very similar to uh, the logical equivalences. Um, the Venn diagrams are, are new, but uh, they're not that complicated. So that was almost like a bit of review. Um, hopefully, uh, it's, it was a short lecture last time, so uh, hopefully you've had time to watch it. Um, and then we went into graphs and graph representation. So we talked a bit about graph terminology, graph representation, and some tom common types of graphs. So we'll review a little bit about, we'll just review the basics. So we're just gonna uh, review simple graphs to start with and how we represent them mathematically. Uh, when we talked about graph representation, this was in a computer. So uh, we were talking about uh, adjacency lists and adjacency matrices. Um, so those are gonna be important things on uh, your next quiz. Um, and yeah, we talked about common types of graphs, which is where we basically left off. This was, uh, so complete graph was probably the most important. Uh, so that's represented by say K3, K4, K subscript something is the complete graph. And so K4 for instance, uh, means that every vertex is, is connected to every other vertex. Um, and the same for K3 and the same for K5. Um, so this week we're going to continue with graph theory. We're going to talk about, we're going to start by talking about subgraphs. Uh, so that's here. Um, so we talked a little bit, we know about subsets. We know what a subset is because we just finished set theory. Um, and we know that graph, rep graph representation uses sets. So subgraphs um, is sort of a, a generalization of this idea of subsets. Um, we're going to talk about spanning trees. Um, these are quite important because they are, uh, uh, a subgraph with uh, the least number of edges possible that still keeps your graph connected. Um, I think we went over what, what a connected graph is, but uh, if not, we'll go over it this week. Uh, cut vertices, we're going to talk about planarity, coloring, searching. Um, so, yeah, it's quite, uh, this is quite a deep and broad field uh, graph theory. There's a lot to it. And so, we're going to touch on all these subjects and get you introduced to them. Um, and see sort of maybe start to get an idea of where they fit in into the bigger picture. Uh, if we get done all that, well, we should get done all that. We'll talk about models of computation. So uh, from graph theory, um, so graph is a, a specific model, a mathematical model and computer model that we use to model, you know, certain phenomena. Um, but now we're going to actually talk about, start talking about algorithms and how we analyze them. So we're going to define an algorithm. Um, and how we analyze them is we basically choose a representative operation. Um, we're going to be using uh, memory access. Um, and then uh, we're going to define what a problem size is in this. And uh, 
so then, uh, and then we're going to tell you, uh, show you what a model of computation is. So you choose basically a representative operation, and then you um, uh, you uh, figure out a function that uh, represents your algorithm um, and is as a function of your problem size. So uh, if you don't understand all that, uh, we're going to go over some some examples, and you'll hopefully see. And then we'll look at the. Uh, We'll use our, our computational model to look at how we uh, analyze algorithms. So that's called asymptotic analysis. Um, and so basically we go through our algorithm, we start counting operations um, and we relate those operations to problem size and uh, we compute the complexity of, of these algorithms. So it seems unlikely we'll get through all of that, but uh, you never know. All right. so. Uh, let's do a little bit of review. Uh, like I said, I hope you guys have watched the lecture. Uh, well, there's not very many of you here right now, but uh, that's, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I almost don't blame, uh, looking outside, I almost don't blame you guys, but uh, you know, hopefully uh, the people who aren't here are, are absorbing these lectures uh, on YouTube. Um, so a graph is an ordered pair, so it's a tuple. So we're, we're talking about, um, sets and sequences and tuples and so these are mathematical concepts so V is a set of vertices and E is a set of edges all right so if this if we had this graph as our as our um, example this is an undirected undirected graph it's also a simple graph um, simple means that um, between any pair of vertices, there's a, at most one edge, and there are no self loops. Um, so these are the vertices. So this Ottawa thing is a vertex, this Toronto thing is a vertex, and this thing that connects them is an edge. And the edge suggests some relationship between Ottawa and Toronto. So this could be a graph of, say, um, uh, you know, uh, flight. Uh, an airline, uh, so these are flight connections perhaps. Um, you can model a, a lot of different things with graphs. So how we represent them is, uh, well here we have G equals VE, so that's our tuple. So a graph is, um, in a sense it's a pair of sets. Uh, one set is the uh, vertices, and uh, I've shortened down the, um, the, the labels of the vertices to the first letter, but uh, so C represents Calgary and O represents Ottawa and uh, L letter Kenny and T Toronto. And then the edge set is a set of sets. And in each of these internal sets, we have a pair of, uh, of vertices. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, each undirected edge is a set of two vertices in this case. And you can, so these are primarily the types of graphs that we're going to be talking about, these simple graphs. Um, and uh, this is undirected. You can have directed graphs. And in directed graphs, I would have an arrow. And in that case, I could have, let's say, uh, in a sense, two edges between Calgary and Ottawa, but only one in each direction if I wanted to have a simple undirected graph. An edge set similar to the adjacency list. Uh, no, it is. Um, well, I mean, what do you, it depends on what you mean by similar. Um, the edge set, uh, an adjacency list is a different way to represent a graph. So I guess in a sense it is similar in that it has all the same information that this, uh, that, uh, this representation does, but this is a mathematical representation. Um, and our adjacency list tends to be, um, you could do that in math as well, but adjacency list tends to be how we represent this on a computer. Adjacency list. So it has all the same information as our math model. Uh, oops. Um, but it's just more convenient to represent on a computer.
Uh, yeah, adjacency list. Um, well, so an adjacency list, it depends on, so now you, uh, adjacency lists, you can actually represent direction, um, uh, but you don't always. So that's sort of um, something that you're going to have to define internally. If you use an adjacency list in your program, you have to define whether this is actually a directed or undirected. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you were uh, referring to. Um, okay. Um, so this is sort of the review of a very, very brief review of all the things we went over. These are sort of the important notes that we're going to need for today's lecture. Um, so is there any other questions on graph representation? Um, okay, good. Um, uh, so this is actually, I think we went over this last week. So by part type graphs, we can go over it again, uh, just as a, just to get us warmed up. <clears throat> so a bipartite graph is a graph. So in a graph is a tuple. So G equals a set of vertices and a set of edges. Um, and the thing that uh, makes a bipartite graph bipartite is we partition the vertex set into two sets V1 and V2, um, such that the union is equal to the full vertex set and the intersection is empty. Uh, so what that means is I just have a set of vertices and I divide them into two non-overlapping uh, sets. That's all. And then uh, the uh, particular thing about a bipartite graph is every edge has one end in V1 and one end in V2. So if you look at my silly little example here, um, this would be a bipartite graph. <laughs> Um, so the only edges between the sets and you're not allowed to have edges. Um, so I would not be allowed to do this, um, because this has, uh, that's an edge between vertices of the same, uh, partition. All right. Then here's a, a very simple example. If we look at, uh, uh, these two as V1 and these three vertices as V2, this is a bipartite graph, uh, because every edge has one vertex in V1 and one vertex in V2. Um, and the complete bipartite graph, uh, so it's K subscript M, uh, comma N. Um, again, we partition the vertices, um, into two, uh, non-overlapping sets, uh, such that the union is the complete, uh, set of vertices. Uh, but now we draw every edge possible between, uh, V1 and V2. So you'll notice that if we look at this vertex here, it's connected to every single vertex in V2. And the same with this vertex is connected to every single vertex in V2. And each of the vertices in V2 is connected to every vertex in V1. So this is K32, um, and this is K33. This is uh, actually quite a common. Um, if you go uh, further into graph theory, you'll see K33 again, um, and again and again. It's, it's important in terms of uh, some of the other things we're gonna learn about today, which is planarity. Um, so K33, every vertex in V1, this guy, for instance, is connected to every vertex in V2 and vice versa. If I choose any vertex here, it's connected to uh, all three of these guys. <clears throat> okay, so that's uh, bipartite graphs and complete bipartite graphs. Um, good, any questions on those? So we are going to see, uh, this guy is gonna co uh, come up again in our lecture today, so this is not, uh, not a wasted uh, warm up. This was stuff that we went over in the last lecture, but. Okay, so here's again our definition of a graph. Um, so here we have a specific graph. Um, so this is the graph we'll be using in our example today. Um, so we have vertices A, B, C, D, E, F, and this is the edge, edge set, um, and the, graphical representation of this, of this mathematical representation is, uh, is this, this graph up here. Okay. All right. So now we're going to talk about subgraphs. So you recall what a subset is, of course. Um, so a subgraph of a graph G, uh, which is of course represented by a tuple, a set of vertices and a set of edges 
is a graph G prime um, equal to V prime uh, E prime, where uh, V prime is a subset of V and E prime is a subset of E. Um, so we don't have to use the primes. Um, we do here because it's convenient. Um, so we don't have to name a subgraph of G equals V E. Um, could be H <coughs> equals, uh, you know, uh, typically we name our vertex sets V, but if we want to say P um, and then O. So that's, this could still, H could still be a subgraph of G. Um, so this, uh, this G prime, uh, V prime, E prime, it's just a convention. It's not necessary, uh, but it's just uh, simple and convenient. And uh, of course, the other thing is that uh, for each edge in E prime, um, each of the vertices, uh, each of the endpoints of that edge uh, must be a vertex in V prime. Um, but that's implied since G prime is a graph. So we don't necessarily have to include that in the definition. Uh, I just did it here for clarity. <clears throat> okay. So if I, this is our original graph uh, right here. So uh, if I wanted to, to take a subgraph of it, I could just say eliminate a couple of edges. And here is a, a subgraph. I could call this uh, G prime uh, equals V prime E prime. And then maybe I could actually even take off uh, a vertex, right? So then my V prime is equal to A, uh, I lost B, so C, D, E, F. And my vertex set is uh, A, E. E, F, E, D, and uh, C, D. <clears throat> All right, so then uh, we could say that G prime is a subgraph of G. Okay, good. Questions on uh, what it is to be a subgraph? So what we can't do, so this is a, a subgraph. What we can't do is add edges that were not in the original graph. So uh, that's not a valid subgraph of, of this guy here uh, because we've added in that extra edge. <clears throat> so that should be, I think, fairly straightforward. Okay, so a subgraph G prime is a spanning subgraph of G if G prime contains every vertex of G. So that is uh, G prime is equal to V uh, E, uh, V prime E prime, where uh, V prime is equal to V and E prime is a subset of E. So this is my graph G here. Um, so a spanning subgraph would be, I just, if I take away an edge, actually, I don't even have to take away an edge because a subset um, E prime could be equal to E, right? <laughs> That's also, if we call that uh, a subgraph, then G is a subgraph of itself, which is true. Um, so we can do a, a graph is a subset of a, a subgraph of itself, but um, if we only took away edges here, then, um, and as long as uh, G prime is connected. So that's the other thing. Um, so G prime has to be connected, and then it's this is uh, G prime would be a spanning subgraph of G. Okay, and all that means is that all the vertices are there, and uh, and the graph is still connected. <clears throat> Good questions. All right. So a proper subgraph of a graph G equals V E is a subgraph uh, G prime equals V prime E prime such that uh, G prime is not equal to itself, right? So uh, this graph here is not a proper subgraph of G um, 
but all I have to do is take away an edge, and now it is a, a proper subgraph, <clears throat> if this is our graph G prime. Okay, so that's, uh, yeah, like I said, a, a graph is a subgraph of itself, but a graph is not a proper subgraph of itself. Okay, good. So that's subgraphs, uh, should be uh, pretty straightforward. Um, any questions? All right. <clears throat> a path is a sequence of edges connecting a sequence of vertices. So you can think of it in a sense as giving directions, right? Although uh, maybe I'm not giving directions to a place, maybe I'm, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, from one place. Uh, strictly speaking, you can double back, you can uh, cross over places where you've already been, and it's still technically a path as long as it's a sequence of edges connecting a sequence of vertices. So I can start at A, and I can go to B, and then I can go to F, and then to E, and then I could even go back to A, um, back to B, and then to C. So then if I wanted to represent this path, um, the sequence of edges would be A, B, F, E, A, B, C. Right? So that's a valid representation of a path. And actually, if it is a simple graph, which this is, uh, this is all we need. Uh, we don't need any more information than that. Um, the, uh, what's implied is that uh, between each uh, pair of vertices in the sequence, there is an edge. So in order for it to be a valid path, those all have to be edges. But we're assuming that, uh, you know, nobody's uh, trying to deceive us here. So uh, you can represent a path by a sequence of vertices. Um, you can also represent it as a sequence of edges. So this, uh, you could say, um, this same path could be represented by AB. Uh, sorry. BF. F E. Uh, yeah, and then you're sort of the order that you're. Well, there's still enough information there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, really, you want um, if there's any sort of if it's not a simple graph, you do need both of these things. Um, but. Um, if it is a simple graph, then, then just the set of vertices or the sequence of vertices is sufficient. Okay. So any, uh, is it clear what a path is? And we use the round brackets because the order matters, right? A path has a definite start vertex and a definite end vertex. And each you know, vertex in, in the between must come in, that, in the order specified. All right, and this is, yes, if it's a simple graph, we could represent the path as a sequence of vertices. <clears throat> um, if we say have a simple path, that does not traverse any edge more than once. So the, uh, the path above was not a simple path because we traversed this edge from A to B twice. Um, so I could have a simple path that goes A, B, B, F, F, E. And then it could even come back to B. Um, it's fine to visit, uh, a simple path can visit a vertex more than once, but not an edge. Okay. Um, and you'd represent it the same way. It's just uh, another property of, uh, <clears throat> that you could, applies to some paths. Um, so a cycle or a circuit is a sequence of edges that starts and ends at the same vertex. Uh, so recall cycle graph from uh, last lecture. So a cycle graph is a, um, some number of vertices uh, connected in a, in a cycle, basically. Um, so an equivalent definition is a path that starts and ends at the same vertex. So let's see if we can... Uh, 
All right, so now we have a, a cycle, say that starts at B and follows these uh, green edges. So if I visit, start with B and then I visit uh, C here, the second is my second vertex and D here is my third one and E is my fourth, F is my fifth. And I end up back at B again, then this is a, a cycle. And I can, on a simple graph, I again can represent that um, as B, C, D, E, F, and B. Okay, and um, I could have longer cycles that contain other cycles as well, right? I don't have to stop at B. I could proceed from B um, to A, and then A to E, and then E back to F, and then back to B again. So that could also be a larger cycle that contains two smaller cycles within it. Okay. <clears throat> and that's, uh, yeah. So any questions on uh, cycles, paths? All right. So an undirected graph is connected if there is a path between every pair of vertices. Okay, so this is uh, something I had mentioned a little earlier, whether a graph is connected or not. Uh, so apparently I did not teach it last class. So in an un unconnected graph, the parts that are connected are called connected components. So let's just say that, uh, so let's say these are two separate graphs. Um, so if I'm looking at just uh, this graph alone, then it, it's connected since there's a path between every pair of vertices. So if I, for instance, label these A, B, C, D, um, then I can get from A to every vertex. There's some path from A to B, there's a path from A to C, and there's a path from A to D. And uh, the same is true for every other vertex, right? There's a path from C to everyone, a path from B to everyone, um, so this is uh, a connected graph, or we could say uh, it's a graph with one connected component. Um, over here, if we're looking at uh, this graph, then um, how many connected components do I have in this graph? Anybody wanna take a guess? So if we remember the definition of graphs, um, does this count as a connection, this crossing? So technically, a path between every pair of vertices means I have A, B, C, D. I don't really have a path from A to C. I, the fact that these, uh, that these edges cross doesn't actually mean anything. So this is one connected component is A, B, and another connected component is C, D. So there's two connected components. All right, and here we have, so let's, how many connected components in this graph? <laughs> yeah, three, exactly. All right, perfect. So we have, uh, this is actually, uh, not only is it uh, its own connected component, I mean, this is actually a graph, right? One vertex is still a graph. Um, so yeah, there's three connected components here. Uh, one, two, three. Okay, so now uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about directed graphs. I didn't, uh, we didn't review directed graphs, but uh, you know, hopefully again, you've, uh, you've recently watched the uh, last video. So a directed graph is, also has this concept of being connected, but if we're talking about directed graphs, we need to talk about whether it's strongly connected or weakly connected. 
So a directed graph is strongly connected if there's a path from A to B and a path from B to A for every pair of vertices A, to a and B um, that are in the, in the vertex set. All right, so if we look at our graph below, um, from A, there's a path to B. If we follow this edge, uh, we can get from A to C, we can get from A to D, and we can get from A to E by following A, B, D, and E. So, and this actually holds true in this graph uh, for every pair of vertices. Um, so I can get from A to everyone. So now can I get from B to A? Uh, and the answer is uh, yes. So I can just follow again. Because I have these two cycles, um, I can get from A to B and from B to A. That doesn't mean there's an edge, and that doesn't mean it's the same path, um, but there definitely exists a path from A to B and from B to A. And this applies for every pair of vertices in our graph. So this is a strongly connected graph. OK, so a directed graph is weakly connected if there is a path from A to B or a path from B to A for every pair of vertices A and B uh, that are in our vertex set. So here, um, let's say I, I take a pair of vertices. Well, let's take A and B. So I have a path from B to A. So if I follow uh, this edge here, um, but I don't have a path from A to B. And in fact, um, A doesn't have any outgoing edges. Um, so there's not a path from A to anyone. So this is a, a weakly connected graph. And for it to be weakly connected, all we need is one example, right? There are more examples, uh, but all I need is the one example. And in this case, the example uh, would be A, B. Okay. Uh, any questions on, uh, so directed graphs or strongly connected graphs or weakly connected graphs? All right, so there's a special type of connected spanning graph without any cycles that's known as a tree. So you guys remember what cycles are? So uh, we've just seen that hopefully. So is this graph here, let's say these are two separate graphs. So this is G1, this is G2. So is G1 a tree? Does anybody know? So no cycle. So what, what was a cycle again? Do we remember that? So let's look at G2. How about G2? Is G2 a tree? So we have actually, yeah, something, a cycle is a path that starts at one vertex and ends at the same vertex. So if I started at, uh, if I labeled this A, and then I can follow these edges and then back at A. So there is a cycle in, in G2, right? However, in G1, uh, there is no cycle. There are no cycles. I can't start at a vertex. Um, well, technically, uh, a cycle has to be, um, A cycle can use the same edge more than once, yes, in the broadest possible sense. So, uh, yeah, actually, let me think for a sec. Uh, I think, uh, no, not, not by this definition, right? Otherwise, I could have a cycle. If I, if I reused edges, um, then I could have a cycle. So a cycle uh, does not use edges more than once. 
Okay. Uh, vertices are okay, but uh, cycle each edge has to be unique. Um, so yeah, that's a good. That's actually a very excellent question. Um, and the answer uh, to Kenna. Uh, uh, just that part is the cycle. So somebody asked if the entire G2 graph is a cycle. Yeah, G1 would be a cycle between two vertices. Well, yes. So a cycle has to have at least three vertices. So yes, uh, in a, in a, if we're talking about in a degenerate sense, uh, two vertices, if I just had this graph, well, now we're getting now we're getting a little bit complicated. But um, technically, that graph would have a cycle through a because of a vacuous proof. Uh, but uh, that's that's sort of getting uh, uh, we're confusing ourselves. So when, in terms of a tree, when we're defining a tree, a cycle has to have at least three vertices and uh, no edge is repeated. Or, you know, equivalently would be uh, at least three edges and no edge is repeated. <clears throat> okay, good. Any other questions? All right. Uh, okay, so this is uh, so this is a tree, and this is uh, not a tree. So what about uh, this graph here? Is this a tree? Yeah, it's a tree. Um, it's also just a path, but it is a tree. So this is. A tree, there are no cycles. Um, what about this? Anybody know what we call this? So in the other examples, uh, our tree was connected. Uh, but what, we, what would we call this? Anybody want to hazard a guess? It sort of makes sense. Um, so this would be called a forest. So it's a, this graph is a, uh, made up of uh, more than one tree. So an unconnected graph where each of the connected components is a tree is known as a forest. Um, so a spanning tree is a spanning subgraph that is a tree. And uh, so we talked, I mentioned that earlier, uh, spanning trees are useful because they have the least least number of edges of any spanning subgraph. <clears throat> and this is uh, when we talk about um, when we're representing graphs in a computer, uh, the less edges, the better, because that means less memory. And in some sense, uh, sometimes more efficient algorithms. <clears throat> How many edges is that? So this is, I'm going to leave this open. So let's say that B equals N vertices. So the cardinality of the vertex set is, is n. So we have n vertices. Um, how many edges would be in, uh, in a spanning tree of this graph? If anybody figures it out, just uh, feel free anytime. So here's a graph. Um, and we want to construct a spanning tree of the following graph. So this happens quite frequently in computer science. Um, we want to keep some basic information about our graph, but we don't want to store all the edges. Um, so spanning trees come in handy for that. Um, so we want to use an algorithm uh, to construct a spanning tree. So what would that be? So, or what would be a good candidate algorithm? Anybody think of one? So one of the things we're definitely going to do is we're going to look at edges and then either accept them as going into our spanning tree or rejecting them. Um, and so uh, a spanning tree, because it's a tree, 
uh, and because it's spanning, so it has every vertex. It's connected. And there are no cycles. Cross dog hell, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, a spanning tree has every vertex, it's connected, and there are no cycles. So we know we need three, these three things to have our spanning tree. So a candidate algorithm is um, look at an edge and then add it if it doesn't create a cycle. So let's try that. So let's start. Um, I want to look at maybe AB first. And A, B does not create a cycle, so I can add it. Maybe I'll use the uh, this guy. <clears throat> so A, B is in our spanning tree. Let's look at B, C. Uh, B, C does not connect a, or does not create a cycle, so I can add that as well. And if we sort of follow the alphabetical order, we then look at C, D. Uh, C, D we can add. There's still no cycles. Uh, D, E, E, F. What about D, F? So if we look at that, um, if we happen to add D, F, then uh, we end up with a cycle, right? So if we looked at D, F at this point, uh, we would have to reject it, all right? Um, maybe we could talk. From F to G. Um, now again, if we looked at uh, C to G, um, now we've introduced the cycle again. So the cycle is in this case uh, C, D, E, F, and G. So uh, we look at that edge and we have to reject it. And in fact, uh, this algorithm works if we just go through and look at every edge and if it doesn't create a cycle we add it so let's let's maybe take a few at random so we can add the edge from C to I that's no problem um, we can add the edge from B to H all right and then at this point uh, you'll notice that it's connected um, so we don't need to add any more edges. Like I said, a spanning tree um, is a, a connected spanning subgraph with the least number of edges, which means as soon as the graph is connected um, and, uh, and there's no cycles, then we're done. So we don't have to look at any more edges. Um, all right, so this algorithm works. I mean, it's, it's very simple. Um, and we have our spanning tree. And it's just a... Spanning tree, again, it's just a spanning subgraph um, with no cycles. That's connected. Well, spanning means connected anyway. So the question is, yes. So that's the other question. So uh, someone asked, if you had gone the other direction, isn't it possible you could have included the edge from G to I? Um, is that possible? Are there other spanning trees? Could we have made a different one? Yeah, so there's, uh, in this graph in particular, there's quite a few different spanning trees. Um, I would have to think actually about how many spanning trees there are based on the number of edges in your graph. Um, I'm not sure if there's a simple definition of that, um, but there are multiple spanning trees, generally speaking, unless your graph is already a spanning tree. So yeah, we could have added uh, the edge. We could, for instance, uh, Someone asked about GI. Well, if I took away CI, I could add GI, right? Because so now I have this edge and I still haven't introduced any cycles. It's connected and uh, it has every vertex. Well, that's actually, that's actually saying the same thing twice. <clears throat> okay, any other questions on spanning trees or this so far on our spanning tree? Okay, so uh, moving on then. Uh, we're going to see spanning trees again when we get into um, search algorithms on graphs. 
Um, but uh, for now, it's enough that you know what a spanning tree is. So a cut vertex is a vertex that, when removed, causes the graph to become disconnected. And a cut edge is an edge that, when removed, causes the graph to be disconnected. All right, so when we remove a vertex, um, so what are the cut edges and what are the cut vertices of this graph? So let's, for what, first let's start by clarifying. If I remove an edge, I can remove this edge, for instance, and that's fine. Um, I don't have to remove any vertex, but if I remove a vertex, G, for instance, I have to remove all the incoming edges. Okay, so that's when we say remove. Um, if I remove an edge, I can remove an edge. I don't have to touch the vertices, but if I remove a vertex, I also have to remove every incoming edge. Okay, so which, which edges, um, if I remove them, would cause this to be uh, disconnected? So what are my cut edges of this graph? BC is a cut edge, yes it is. So if I, if I removed BC, I'll just write this down. But if I remove BC, then I, I have two connected components. I've disconnected my graph. Um, so BC is a cut edge. Uh, what other ones? AD, yeah, sorry. I somehow messed up. My <laughs> sorry, give me one second here. Well, I, I'll fix that at the break. <clears throat> I messed up my chat window somehow. All right, all right, back in business. <clears throat> um, so AD is a cut edge, somebody said. Um, yeah, so if I remove AD, um, let's do that, then I've disconnected my graph because D is now all by its lonesome. So AD is a cut edge. Um, any others? So yeah, so actually that is, uh, those are the two cut edges. Um, every other edge, if we remove it, does not disconnect the graph. If we remove it by itself without touching any of the other edges. Uh, what about cut vertices? So cut vertices, we have a lot more, a lot more to choose from. A, B, C. Uh, yep, A, B, and C. Those will all disconnect our graph. Uh, is there any other ones? So if I take away E, no. If I take away D, no. G, no. F, no. So yeah, A, B, and C are our cut vertices. Um, right. Uh, so that's it for uh, basically this is your introduction to to graph theory. Um, I think uh, the next thing we're going to look at is uh, graph searching. So we're going to uh, revisit spanning trees when we do graph searching. But uh, any other questions on cut vertices or cut edges before we uh, move on? Okay. 6.30. So I think uh, generally I, um, no, we don't need to take a break yet. Why do we need cut vertices and cut edges? Um, uh, so if you're talking about, yeah, so cut vertices and cut edges are, are sort of, uh, they represent the number of cut edges and cut vertices could be some indication of how robust your network is, for instance. So let's say um, if we are using a graph to model um, a computer network, um, 
Then if I have a cut, yeah, if I have a cut vertex, uh, so uh, C for instance, if that if that computer goes down, then um, I have my my graph becomes disconnected and my network no longer can communicate. So G and F can't communicate with uh, A, B, C, D, and E, right? So if C goes down, um, then whoever is operating these computers can't talk uh, over to the other side. And uh, the same for a cut edge. So if some line goes down, so if I have one, uh, if I don't have any redundancies between B and C and this, this edge goes out, then I've disconnected uh, C and F and G from A and B and D and E. Uh, yeah, so um, trace contact and pirate contact. Um, trace contacting. So, so Sean has mentioned uh, an example of trace contacting virus contacts. I, I'm not. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, today we're all we're talking about coronavirus, and this is some of the stuff I've been looking at. Uh, so. When we look at your social networks, uh, we talk about stuff like um, net, uh, Facebook and, uh, and other social networks. You know, look at who am I connected to, who are my friends, and all this. Graph theory applies to this. This can also be used to be able to trace if I have a vi if I've caught coronavirus, who have I contacted, and then when you find somebody in your contact list that does not exhibit the behaviors. So that would break the graph because it would be that person and everybody that they're connected to are not connected to you anymore because they don't have exhibit the, the, uh, the virus. So anybody else that's connected to them who may have the virus will not have it because of you if you had it originally. So this is where they do their trace contacting. This is something that's being used right now within governments and agencies like uh, World Health Organization. Cool. Yeah, that's an excellent, excellent example. Um, so yeah, part of our uh, social distancing and the reason why uh, we're doing this over Zoom is we're creating more uh, cut edges and cut vertices uh, so that we don't spread the virus. Yeah, yeah. So thank, uh, thank you very much, Sean. Um, all right. Any other questions? Okay, um, let's go. So we'll move on then to our next topic, which is actually uh, still um, graph theory. But uh, now we're gonna talk a little bit about graph searching. Um, so this brings us back to uh, uh, spanning trees. Um, so now these are, uh, again, these are uh, based off the slides of Dr. Robert Collier. Um, however, I've made some modifications to them, so if you find a mistake, um, that's certainly, almost certainly mine. Um, and, you know, all the, uh, the wonderful diagrams and stuff, you can mostly credit uh, Dr. Robert Collier. <clears throat> okay, so uh, on the topic of graphs, uh, so introduction to searching a graph. So we consider a hypothetical game of tic-tac-toe. Um, and it's currently X's turn. So what are the different ways that this game could end? Well, there's actually a finite number of ways that this game can be played. Um, you could actually graph out all of them. But in this particular instance, we have uh, one, two, three, I probably shouldn't put O's there, but let's say I did, uh, there's one spot here, two spot here, spots here, and three spots here. So I could put an X in any one of those three locations. So now I have uh, three different possibilities. And then from there, uh, on O's turn, O can put, um, let's say I put an X here, then O would have two possibilities. So I could put an O here or an O here. Um, but the point is that there are a finite number of possibilities 
and each of these moves is discrete, so it's uh, sort of a good candidate to be represented by a computer. And in fact, um, well, well, let's graph this out. So this is um, uh, a version of tic-tac-toe where it's X is turn, and I could put an X there, I could put an X there, or I could put an X there. So I'm gonna graph out the different uh, ways that I can uh, make my moves. So now if we want to look at this guy here, um, now it's O's turn. If we assume that I put my X there, then O could put a, their O there, or they could put their O there. So I've, I've looked at, you know, I've made, I've looked two moves ahead in my game and I've seen, uh, well, in this case, O wins. And um, in this case, uh, no one has won yet. <clears throat> um, and then I can go to my other possibility here and I could say, well, of the two locations left, O could put one there and then they win or O could put one here and then they win. So if I'm playing X and I want to um, you, you know, design an AI to play this tic-tac-toe tic game for me, um, if I'm playing X, I probably don't want to make this move because if I do, then no matter what happens, um, O is going to win, right? <clears throat> and then uh, finally, if we go to uh, this guy over here, then I can put an O here and an O here. Uh, I thought I fixed this. That should be there. Yeah, this is basic game theory. So a lot of a lot of what you see uh, as AI is basically, um, and, and particularly you know in video games, but not just video games. Uh, there's lots of anything that basically you can game. Um, you can sort of trace out all the possibilities um, uh, in a graph like this and see which ones are good. And then you basically put a value on these things, right? So if I have, uh, I know if I get to this point, then, um, so if I get to this guy here, uh, I wanna put a low value on taking that move. And if I go over here, um, you know, uh, well, actually there's no, uh, is there anyone where X wins? Yeah, well here X wins. Um, so maybe I put a higher value on making this move. Um, so yeah, that's how we do. Uh, we use graphs to sort of, um, for game theory, to, uh, uh, to plot out possible moves and then place values on them and uh, uh, based on whether or not we win or lose at the end. And then there's generally a lot of pruning that goes on, but that's sort of a, a little bit advanced. Um, let's say we had a maze that we wanted to navigate. Now this maze has no entrance and no exit, but we could, you know, maybe there's a, a piece of cheese here and uh, we're a little mouse uh, with some whiskers and a tail. <clears throat> so how could we represent this as a graph? So we want to apply, a, we want to make an AI again, that will find the cheese based on our current location. Well, um, we can select a location, uh, discrete location. Um, so if this was a real uh, mouse and a real piece of cheese, then um, our maze is sort of a, an analog maze, right? Um, but we want to represent it discreetly. Um, so we could represent all these different locations by nodes or vertices. And then if I can move from, say, here to here, then I'm going to put an edge in between them. <laughs> and if I'm, for instance, uh, blocked by a wall, then I would not put an edge between uh, these two vertices. So I could take this, this maze and represent it as a graph by simply having the paths that I can take instead of the walls where I can't go. All right, and then this I can represent in a computer, and then I can start to uh, wander around in it um, on my computer. All right. So a search starts at a specific vertex and then visits um, other vertices based on, you know, uh, who my neighbors are. So I, I, I can only visit other vertices that I'm connected to. Um, and so uh, if a specific vertex is reached, for instance, in our previous example, we had a piece of cheese here. So if we reach the cheese, then we know we're done. 
Um, uh, but what order should we should we visit the vertices? Um, so we could select them at random, and you know, uh, at some point you would visit all the vertices in a random walk. But that's not really the most efficient way to do it. So. Um, what we're going to do is sort of uh, visit them all in a very uh, methodical uh, manner so that uh, we do as few wasted moves as possible. Uh, so to start with, we uh, this is called the depth first search. So we mark all vertices as unvisited, then we start at an arbitrary vertex um, unless one is specified. So if we go back to our example, if I had a mouse at a specific uh, vertex, then that's where I would start. Um, I move to an unvisited neighbor, and then I repeat until every neighbor is visited. Um, if I run out of unvisited neighbors, um, then I backtrack. It's called backtracking. I return to the most recently visited vertex and visit those neighbors. And if that vertex is out of neighbors, then I backtrack again to the most recently visited vertex and, and so on and so forth. So let's take a look at... Uh, so I have two examples. Um, I have this one, and then I have a different one that's a, a simpler graph, but it's um, because it's simpler, we can uh, go through the entire thing. Here, we will go through part of the example and then uh, pretend that we went through the rest. So let's say we started at the vertex R, um, and then if we have a choice of neighbors, we're going to choose in alphabetical order which ones we should visit first. So we would visit uh, M first, uh, Q second, and S third. All right, so we are currently at M, so we visited R and M. And then from M, uh, we have an unvisited neighbor N, so we go to N. And then from N, we have an unvisited neighbor O, so we go to O. And if we, um, yeah, so if we come to a choice, so from O, let's say we go to T, and then we go to uh, Y, and then we go to X. Uh, and then if we have a choice, so we're at X, uh, we simply visit uh, in alphabetical order. So uh, we go to S first, and then we come back to X. We go to W, and then we backtrack all the way to R, and then next we would visit uh, Q. Um, so like I said, uh, this is not the most complete, uh, example. I have another example where we go completely through the algorithm, um, but this is a, so this would be a nice little rough introduction. Um, the thing about this example, the reason why I didn't get rid of it entirely is it does have, uh, it does cover a few points that I want covered. So, uh, so the other type of search, that was a depth first search. And why depth first search is because, um, we start at a vertex in this case R and we go as deep as we can go. Uh, before we have to backtrack. So uh, in this case, we went M, N, O, T, Y, X, S, and then we don't have any unvisited neighbors from S. There is an edge here, but we've already been to R. So at that point, we backtrack. So it's called a depth first search. We go as deep as we can go in the graph before we have to backtrack and then visit another, um, another unvisited neighbor. So in breadth first search, uh, we're going to, this is gonna uh, go a little bit differently. So we're gonna keep a list of visited vertices, um, including the start vertex. And we're gonna add all adjacent vertices uh, to the list at the end. And then when we wanna visit a vertex, well, the one we visit is, is the one we pull off the front. Um, so when we use a, a list that way, we can call it a queue, which is basically, you know, if you ever stand in line at the bank or whatever, that's a, a queue. Um, but that's a, a data structure that we, we often use. But um, So we move vertices from the front of the list and add their unvisited neighbors to the end of the list. Okay, so let's look at the same example. So we start with R. Uh, this is our list. We've added R to the list. Um, so we've added it to the back of the list and we're gonna draw it off the front of the list. And then we're going to add the neighbors of R to the back of the list. So here, um, we added some transparency there, and that means that I've taken that vertex off of the list. Um, so the list now consists of M, Q, S. Um, I'm just keeping this here to uh, help illustrate the algorithm. Okay, so we've added the, the neighbors to the end of the list. 
Now we're going to look at, uh, now we're going to take the next neighbor, uh, the next vertex off the front. So that's M. So now we take M off and we add the neighbors of M. Uh, yeah, so we add the neighbors of M, which is N. So we've added N to the back of the list. Uh, so now the next vertex we look at is Q. We're going to take that and we're going to add the neighbors of Q. So that in this case is P and L. Uh, so we've added these at the end. And uh, uh, again, these ones are, are vertices that are no longer in our, in our Q, in our list. Um, and then who do we pull off? We pulled off S. And then we've added the neighbor of S, X. Um, so this is how we explore using a breadth-first search. All right, so this also produces a spanning tree, but the spanning tree is different. So we've skipped over a lot of details here, um, but I have another example that will uh, hopefully illuminate them for you. Um, so any obvious differences? Uh, so how far away is S from R? So, yeah. So in this case, S uh, is very far away. We did not take this edge, uh, but in this case we did. Um, so that's something I want you to think about. Uh, what are the differences here? And uh, hopefully that will become more clear. Um, so I'm going to go into a different example now that uh, it's smaller and because it's smaller, we can do it uh, in uh, its entirety. But uh, is there any questions on these before we go ahead? Anything that's not clear at this point? Well, I'm sure there's plenty that's not clear, but. Okay. <clears throat> so again, this is just the uh, definition of depth first search. So let's, so now we have a simpler graph that we can, uh, we're gonna start at A and we're gonna go through uh, <clears throat> our depth first search on this. So that's our start vertex. We're gonna visit B. Um, so this red edge means uh, that's an edge that we're gonna add to our spanning tree um, or, yeah. So again, the depth first search, um, it doesn't necessarily, uh, you may have noticed here that we did end up with two spanning trees. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can, um, one of the things that can happen when we do these searches is we can build the spanning tree. We don't necessarily have to, but it's one thing that we can do. So in addition to remembering the vertices, um, we remember the edges. So we visit B, we add that edge, and from B we we're going to visit C. So we have that edge. Um, from C we have an unvisited neighbor D, so we're going to go there. From D we have an unvisited neighbor E, so we're going to go there. And E goes to F. And then from F, we don't have any unvisited neighbors. Um, and if we backtrack to E, uh, you'll see that E does not have any unvisited neighbors because uh, A, C, B, and D have all been visited. So we're going to backtrack all the way to D. And then finally at D, we have some unvisited neighbors. Um, so we're going to visit G and H. Um, and then we're going to backtrack all the way to A because there's, we visited every vertex, so at this point we're done. And that's, uh, so that's basically the algorithm for depth first search. And that's um, on an assignment or a test, that's how you would do it. Um, and if you have a choice between more than one vertex, you would choose them in either alphabetical order, if they're given in alphabetical order, or numerical order. All right, any questions? Okay, so we'll finish up our example. Um, breadth first search now on this same graph. Um, so yeah, this is, and like I said, the depth first search, we don't necessarily have to build a spanning tree, but if we sort of uh, take the edges, um, each edge that we traverse to go to a new vertex, if we add it to our, our subgraph, then we can, we can make the spanning tree. And uh, so if we sort of, rearranged the vertices and drew our spanning tree a little bit differently, it might look something like this. Okay, breadth first search. Yes, so we're going to start at A. Um, 
And this time I will um, handle the list explicitly. Actually, this should be a, we're talking math, this should be a sequence. So we've added A to our list. Um, and we visit all the uh, first level neighbors of A, right? So these are, we're gonna add them to our list. And, but that also means when we've added them to our list, we've in a sense visited them. So we're gonna add also uh, these edges here to our spanning tree, all right? So we add all the neighbors of A uh, before we add anywhere, anyone else. And that's why this is called a breadth first search as opposed to a depth first search um, because we're going to, you know, first explore level by level the graph in a sense. Okay, so A is gone, and now we want to uh, look at B. So B is at the start of our list now. Um, so we're going to look at all the neighbors of B. Uh, yeah, so B, C, D, and G are all the vertices at distance one from A. So now we go to B, and we're going to visit E. So E is the only unvisited neighbor from B. So we're going to add E to the end of our list, and B uh, gets taken away. Okay, so then next, uh, uh, there's no more. We could not add C because C has already been added. So E is the only unvisited neighbor of B. Um, so now we simply go to the, the front of the list again. We take away C. Uh, we notice that C has no unvisited neighbors. Um, so we're going to take away D. C is a dead end. <clears throat> we start at D and we add F and e. H. <clears throat> so F and H get added to our list and those edges get added to our spanning tree. All right, so now next we're going to look at G. Uh, G has no unvisited neighbors. E has no unvisited neighbors, F has no unvisited neighbors, and H has no unvisited neighbors. Um, all right, so this is our, our spanning tree now, and if we rewrite it, uh, redraw it, uh, sort of as, a, as how we traditionally draw trees, then we end up with this graph. This, and this is a, a spanning tree. And informally, you can think of the breadth first search as visiting your graph level by level. So we start at A, we visit all the distances, all the vertices at distance one from A, and then next we visit all the vertices at distance two from A, and then we visit all the vertices at distance three from A. In this case, we don't have any, but if they were there, that's what we would, uh, that's what we would add. So that's what our algorithm ends up doing. The breadth first search uh, goes through your graph level by level. So here are two spanning trees of the same graph, um, but they look very, very different. And uh, so what's, uh, I don't know, can anybody see what the sort of the advantage is of the breadth first search over the depth first search? Or what the advantages of the depth first search over the breadth first search? So these are both, uh, um, you know, they're, they're used for different things. Less branching. Yeah, it takes fewer edges to get somewhere with the breadth first search. That's true. So that's, in particular, that's what, to, so if you wanted something deep in your graph, if you were searching for a piece of cheese, maybe the depth first search might be the smarter way to go. Um, but yeah, from A, whoops, any path to any vertex has very few edges. So from A, I can get to anywhere very quickly. I can find all these paths and in fact, um, each of those paths that it finds is actually the shortest path. So if I go back to this breadth first search tree, um, from A, I found the shortest path through my graph to all the other vertices. Okay, any questions on breadth first search, depth first search? All right, so we're, we're going to take a break right now. Um, I've got 6.55, so we'll come back at uh, 7.05. And, uh, and uh, if you think of any questions, I'll answer them. And if not, we'll move on to our uh, models of computation. All right, so 7.05. <clears throat>
All right. Um, so I lied. We have more graph theory to cover. Um, but before we do that, um, I'm going to go over something that's relevant to the quiz and, and uh, also to the assignment. Um, so it is something that I did cover um, in the lectures, but maybe it was not emphasized enough in the notes. Um, so if you didn't watch the lectures, uh, or if you were, you know, and who can blame you if you slept through part of it, then uh, uh, you could have missed it. So um, <clears throat> let me share my screen and then, uh, okay, so this is um, assignment two, this is the solutions. Um, and there's an assignment like this on your quiz. So um, it's very important if you're going to do an existential instantiation. So basically you want to instantiate uh, one item and uh, in this case the item is, is Y. Um, so you can do that with an, if you use an existential, existential instantiation, then sort of a rule of thumb is that you should do it first. Um, because um, if I instantiate something with an existential instantiation, I can then apply universal instantiation. That's no problem. Um, but I can't apply another existential instantiation on it, right? So I can say I can't um, do an existential instantiation on uh, this line C and then uh, do this one. So you can't do that because these are two different, these are going to be two different things. If I instantiate that, if I instantiate this as C of Y, then this would have to be C of Z or something. But these are, uh, sorry, these are going to be two different things, right? And sort of the, um, um, uh, sort of the analogy would be, if I said, uh, I could say something like, there exists um, an animal that is a fish, all right? So that's true. And then I could say, uh, there exists an animal that lives in a tree, that's also true. Um, but if I instantiate, uh, if I say there exists an, an, uh, an animal that is a fish, I can say, well, I have a trout. And then I say, if I do another existential instantiation and say that, well, that then now I'm claiming that trout lives in a tree, which is not true. So we can get to logical fallacies by applying this existential instantiation twice. But if I said uh, there is an animal that is a fish and all fish have gills, um, then that's a existential followed by a for all and that's logically consistent. All right, so uh, just be aware of that. If you're going to do existential instantiation, you're going to do it first and you're only going to do it once. All right. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, any questions? All right. Um, and the same applies for the, the practice quiz. Uh, if this is question two on the practice quiz, um, you're going to want to do the existential first if you're going to use these. If you're going to use um, uh, a y and f y in your uh, proof so to speak uh, then you're going to want to instantiate it first you have to otherwise logically uh, you're saying something inconsistent so could whoever uh, 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 i can figure out how to do it i guess but. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm trying to figure out how to mute him. Uh, uh, sorry, give me a second. Uh, Um, I guess, can I mute him on the...
Ah, here we go. All right, I think I got it. Okay. Good. All right. Sorry about that. Um, great. Any other any questions on the? If you can do existential instantiation, you got to do it first. Um, you can apply a. You can apply a universal instantiation after an existential, but you can't do vice versa. Um, okay. Um, all right. So yeah, I did lie about that. Uh, so this is what I get for jumping back and forth from uh, my recording. Yes, I am recording. Okay, so um, yeah, so let's jump back into OneNote then. Um, all right, so planarity and graph coloring. Um, so we're gonna start with the graph isomorphism. So um, are these the same graph? Well, let's take a look at what's the evidence here. And what do we mean by same graph? <clears throat> well, uh, the vertex set is the same. Um, so each one has vertices A, B, C, and D. So V is the same for both. Um, the edge set happens to be the same. So uh, we have an edge from every vertex to every other vertex. So the edge set for both of these two graphs are the same. <clears throat> Um, and there's other things, you know, every vertex is degree three and connected to every other vertex, uh, both are K4, which is the complete graph on four vertices. So are they the same graph? Well, let's look at these two graphs. Uh, so two graphs of the same number of vertices connected in the exact same way are isomorphic. So here we have um, this graph, which we can represent mathematically here. And we have this other, other graph, which we represent mathematically here. Um, and all that's changed is the labels, right? So I could replace um, A, uh, one with A and two with B and three with C and four with D. So even though that th these uh, two graphs are, the vertices are labeled differently, they're, they're isomorphic with each other, which means they're, in a sense, sort of the same graph. Or we could think of them as the same graph or in the same uh, very, very narrow class. <clears throat> All right. However, one big difference is that the left graph has crossing edges, uh, while the right-hand graph does not. Um, so can every graph be drawn without crossing edges? And I'm talking strictly two dimensions now. Um, anybody want to hazard a guess at that? Yeah, no. So the answer is no. Um, and if we, graphs that can be drawn without crossing edges are called planar graphs. So that means that, so this graph is a planar graph. So here we've drawn it with a crossing edge, but we can draw it without one. With, um, so it's a planar graph. And the drawing without crossings is called the planar representation. So if we look up here, this is the planar representation. <clears throat> um, so why might it be important to draw graphs without crossing edges? <clears throat> um, well, let's think about uh, the types of things that we model with graphs. So uh, microchips are one thing we might model so we have a you know a CPU and some registers and some memory and we have some wires that are connecting them and every time we cross uh, some wires in our graph uh, we have to put those wires on different layers of the chip we have to we have to be physically separated so that we don't short circuit our chip and that's costly that's cost more uh, it makes for a more complex chip um, so it adds complexity and expense highways so if i have 
by making a road network and I have highways that intersect, now I need an overpass. And those are big, expensive. Um, again, it, it comes down to uh, expense uh, a lot of the time. And even regular roads, uh, even if it's not a highway, I have a regular road that's an intersection, it's a bottleneck, um, I have to put lights or a stop sign or a roundabout, and there's gonna be you know, traffic jams and things like that. So uh, in a lot of the things that we model, uh, crossing edges are, are things that we don't want. Subway is of course the same thing. Um, if I have two subways that cr subway lines that cross, then one has to go above the other. Um, so we either have to dig or put something, one of them on a, on a, a bridge type thing. Um, not only that, wireless networks. So let's say these are, um, so my graph is modeling, I have some sort of little uh, radio tower here, right? And I'm gonna broadcast to this guy, um, but these two guys are radio towers as well. Um, so the thing about, uh, thing about wireless networks is the, uh, um, the cost or the power it requires to uh, send my signal is uh, uh, the square of the distance, right? So um, if something is twice as far away from me, I need four times the power uh, in order to communicate properly with it. Which means that if I have two crossing edges, well, this guy's gonna blast out a large signal to this guy, and he's gonna drown out both of these guys. And the same thing when this guy blasts a signal over here, he's gonna drown out both of those guys. So there's gonna be a lot of destructive interference. Not only that, um, instead of crossing edges, because uh, the power is uh, the square of the distance, um, it's actually cheaper to send my signal here and then to here. Um, that costs a lot, a lot less energy. So uh, yeah, so uh, these planar graphs and planar representation um, are also very uh, relevant for wireless networks. <clears throat> okay. So oh, good. So that should all be straightforward. If there's any questions, feel free to jump in. Um, so you remember our bipartite graph. This is the complete bipartite graph, uh, K33. And the question is, uh, can K33 uh, be drawn without crossings? Um, so what do you guys think? I mean, we're going to try, but yes, yeah. I mean, it looks like it, it doesn't look like there's a lot of edges. <clears throat> Just move V5. Okay, well, let's try it. So recall graph isomorphism. So um, if I, you know, I'm going to draw a version of the graph, and if I have to change the labels on certain vertices, um, it's still gonna be essentially the same graph. So let's try it. So let's look at, uh, so we look at V1. V1 is uh, connected to V4 and V5, and V2 is also connected to V4 and V5. So I can draw them. Um, this is a, a subgraph, and it's basically isomorphic to if I had chosen uh, V2, V3, V5, and V6 instead. Right, so I've drawn part of my K33, um, four vertices, and I have two left to place. I have uh, V3 and V6 left to place. So V1, yeah, so this is just, when we're explaining the graph here. Um, so we'll start with V3. So essentially there are two possible regions or faces of this graph where I can place V3. So I can place it inside this cycle, so here, or I can place it outside the cycle here. Um, but regardless of where I put it, the two graphs are gonna be isomorphic. So let's say I placed it inside, and then I have this graph here. Um, and then let's say I placed it outside. Um, so in both cases, it has to connect to V4 and V5. So that's sort of the definition of my bipartite graph. So both cases I have connected it to V4 and V5, 
Um, but if I take this and I move the vertices, I move V2 up here and V3 following it, then I get uh, this graph, and that's isomorphic to this graph, right? So whether I place V3 inside uh, the cycle or outside the cycle, it's essentially the same graph, okay? So we've placed, now we've placed uh, five vertices, so we have one left to place. We have to place V6. And if we look back at our original graph, V6 must connect to V1, V2, and V3. So where are we going to put it? And as I said, so far, um, we've ended up with this graph, and we've essentially had no choice in the matter. So we can move how we've drawn it. Um, we can move where exactly the vertices are, but the connections all have to be there, and it's always going to end up looking like this because of graph isomorphism. <clears throat> all right, so V6 must connect to V1, V2, and V3. Now, essentially, I have three regions or faces to place it. Um, right, so let's try uh, V6 here. So this is one region, and it has to connect to V1, V2, and V3. Well, I can connect to V1 and V3, um, but to connect to V2, I now have to cross some edge. So I either have to cross here or here, or I have to cross one of these guys. Um, so if I place V6 there, um, I have to cross, I'll end up crossing something. So I can't put V6 there. So Let's try putting V6 here. Well, essentially this is, you know, you might notice that this is actually isomorphic to that one. Um, so if I want to, I connect V6 to V2 and V3, but now I want to connect to V1. That requires either crossing here, 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 or here. So I can't place V6 there because uh, I'm going to end up crossing some edge there too. So there's basically one place left I could put it. Um, so let's put V6 on the outside. And now I can connect to V2. I can connect to V1. But if I want to connect to V3, um, I have to cross some edge uh, somewhere. Great. And if I, you know, drew this graph a little bit differently or relabeled the vertices, um, doesn't matter. So these are, because it's all going to be isomorphic to the cases that we've shown here. All right, so we've done some case analysis, basically, and in a, in a very rough sense, we've proven that, uh, proven that K33 uh, is not planar. So we cannot draw it without crossing edges. All right. Um, so, any questions? You guys believe me? Was that convincing? Or is there anything you think you could do differently that would maybe? Yeah. So it's. It seems like it. There's not very many edges, but it's just enough so that it is not planar. <clears throat> So a face is a region bounded by edges, right? So um, if I have this graph, so how many faces do I have in this graph? This is uh, K4. <clears throat> it's the planar representation of K4. So how many, how many faces are there? A little bit of a trick question, but it's not. Yeah, there's four actually. So, very good. There's one, two, three, and then there's four is this outer region, All right? That represents a face. So, so the outer region is in a sense bounded by edges. And you could think of it, if it helps, you could think of this K4 as being on a ball or a sphere, and then. Uh, there's sort of a, a finite region that's encompassed. This four represents a finite region. Where here it sort of represents an infinite region. 
Okay. Um, so if I take a graph G equal to VE and it's connected, um, and let's say that it has F faces and it's a planar graph. Uh, then Euler's formula states that if I take the number of vertices and I subtract the number of edges and add the number of faces, I always get two. Right? So that's, uh, there's some fairly trivial proofs, but we're not going to go into that. Let's look at a couple of examples. Um, so if we look at this graph, um, the number of vertices is one, two, three, four, five. Uh, the number of edges is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And the number of faces is uh, 1, 2, 3, plus 3 uh, equals 2. Right? So it seems to hold in this case. Uh, what about here? So let's look at this graph. We have uh, four vertices. We have three edges, and how many faces are in this graph? Oops. So there's only one face in this graph, eh? So there's just this infinite outer region. Uh, since there's no cycles that, if I, if I added an edge here, then I would have two faces, but uh, there's no cycles. This is a tree, and a tree only has one face, so plus one equals two, which, so Euler's formula holds in this case as well. All right, so this is a, uh, a very important uh, formula, and you can tell a lot of things about uh, graphs sort of just using this. Um, any questions? All right. So let's let's look at sort of. You don't have to remember how we get. To, we're going to look take Euler's formula. And we're going to get to another formula that's also useful in proving some things. You don't have exactly have to remember how we get there. So, but if you consider each edge bounds two faces, right? Um, if there's, unless it's a, it might be the same face as in the case of a tree here, this edge bounds two phases, but they're both the same. Um, but if I look at say uh, this edge here, then I have one face here and one face here. And then if it's a maximally planar graph, if I have a triangulation basically, so the smallest face I can have has three edges. Um, that's the smallest number of edges that can bound any face. So that means um, if I have uh, a triangulation, then I have this uh, equality, three times the number of faces is equal to twice the number of edges, right? But the faces may actually be bigger, right? I could have faces with more than three edges. So then we have an inequality, three times the number of faces is less than or equal to twice the number of edges. Um, so what we can do is we could take Euler's formula, um, do a little bit of algebra, so that we get f is equal to two minus the number of vertices plus the number of edges. And then we're going to substitute this into this f here. Um, and then, you know, if you like algebra, you can follow this. Uh, I'm not gonna, this is where, you know, I would generally lose a lot of people because, uh, Tends to be hard to, to follow these types of things in uh, presentations sometimes. But uh, if you do the algebra, you get to this, the number of edges is less than or equal to uh, three times the number of vertices. So this should be capital V, cardinality of that. So E, the number of edges is less than or equal to three times the number of vertices minus six in a planar graph. Okay, so that, this gives us sort of another way to tell if a graph is planar or not. So let's consider uh, K5, uh, and this is misspelled, but uh, does K5 have a planar representation? Well, let's take a look. Um, K5 has uh, four plus three plus two plus one, it has 10 edges, 
so you can count them and convince yourself. Uh, this was part of last lecture, um, how we can count the number of edges in a uh, in a complete graph. <clears throat> um, so now our formula is number of edges is less than or equal to three times the number of vertices minus six. K5 has five vertices and 10 edges. So three times five minus six, 10 is less than or equal to nine, which is false. So therefore, K5 does not have a planar representation, or maybe is not planar. Right. And so when you're trying to prove if a graph is planar or not, uh, you use K5 and K33, uh, the complete bipartite graph, and uh, the complete graph on five vertices. Um, so if, if they have K5 or K33 as a subgraph or as a what's called a minor, um, then they cannot be planar. But that's, that's a little bit advanced. But they are both very sort of important graphs for proving uh, planarity. <clears throat> All right. Good. Any questions? As I said, you don't, you don't have to derive this. Um, just be aware that it exists. If you're ever doing a test, uh, I mean, they're, all our tests are open books, so you can always look this up. Um, Euler's formula as well. Those are just two, this formula and Euler's formula uh, are two very useful tools for, for telling a lot about graphs without actually, you know, having to do the work of trying to draw every combination. So uh, these tell us a lot about planar graphs. <clears throat> Okay, good. All right, so graph coloring. <clears throat> um, so in our very first lecture of this course, we did, uh, we did a small example of graph coloring. Uh, so here we're gonna do another one. So let's consider a cell phone network. So again, these are uh, little radio towers that uh, are connecting to your cell phones and letting you communicate. And I've labeled them A, B, C, D, E, and F. <clears throat> All right, and each of them is responsible for the region that you see defined. But of course, if you're blasting out a signal, um, the signal goes out in a circle, you know, minus obstacles or whatever. Um, so the signal from the, uh, the tower at A would reach, say, this far. So I could connect if I was a person here, I could be connected to A but maybe there's somebody else here. And now F actually overlaps with A here. So this guy's connected to F and this guy's connected to A. Um, but the problem is that if these guys are on the same frequency, uh, these are going to interfere with each other, right? So you want A and F, we want A and F to have different frequencies. Crosstalk, yeah. Uh, what is cross? <laughs> is that where you get interference on your cell phone? I'm not sure. Yeah, so crosstalk apparently. Yeah, so crosstalk is where you get the interference. So this. So if you're designing a cell phone network, you have um, you want to do different frequencies, but also you have a very limited uh, uh, bandwidth of frequencies that you can use. So that's assigned by whatever the governing body is. Um, so you don't have an infinite number of them, right? So you have a finite number of frequencies, and if you want a good signal, you know you probably want to take up a certain amount of that bandwidth. Uh, I don't know if bandwidth is actually the proper name, but uh, it's similar to that. Um, so one thing we could do to solve this problem, uh, this problem of wanting different frequencies is build a graph. Um, so anytime, uh, so if A is neighbors with B, as in this case, then I'm going to draw an edge here. And if uh, A is neighbors with C, I'm going to draw an edge here. 
and et cetera. So everyone who's a neighbor, uh, I'm going to connect with an edge, right? So we get this graph here. <clears throat> um, and as a bonus question, uh, you can look it up. I mean, this is pretty common knowledge, but uh, maybe something to think about. If you build a graph based on intersecting regions by connecting them, like a map, for instance, uh, of all the provinces or what have you, um, is it planar? So can we always draw that without crossings? Uh, because that, that's what happens quite often, is we do get these types of graphs that are based off these sort of uh, geographic uh, representations. <clears throat> so yeah, that's something to think about. <clears throat> So now we want to assign frequencies to each of these uh, vertices. Uh, and when we talk about graphs, we talk about coloring them. So when we say, when we assign a different color, uh, red, blue, and green, for instance, would represent distinct non-interfering frequencies. <clears throat> All right, so we can assign some color. So let's, uh, maybe let's try, uh, we'll make A red. So now A is connected to everybody, so uh, no one else can get red, but I can give blue to B, um, which is fine. Um, and then maybe I can give also blue to D and also blue to F. So uh, F is not connected to anybody else that's blue, B is not connected to anybody else that's blue, and D is not connected to anybody else that's blue. <clears throat> and then I could assign green to G and E. And then I have um, what's called a valid coloring. So a valid coloring of a simple graph is the assignment of a color to each vertex such that no two adjacent vertices are assigned the same color. So this here is a valid coloring. Um, and it would represent, you know, and this is a solution to my cell phone tower problem. I need three different frequencies and then I can, you know, give one to A and then, uh, you know, uh, so on and so forth. And so the chromatic number of a graph, uh, which is represented by this, uh, this fancy looking X, <clears throat> uh, with, uh, of G, is that Chi? Oh, that's, ah, uh, cool. This is called Chi apparently. Chi. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so that's a so the chromatic number of a graph is the smallest number of colors required for a valid coloring. So how do we know what the smallest color is? Well, that's let's think back to our original problem. Uh, this was in the first lecture we looked at. Uh, so we have this intersection problem deciding on an efficient programming for traffic lights. So if I'm say uh, here at A and I want to make a right. Uh, or maybe I want to go straight, then I can't, so I can have a green light from A to C, but I can't have at the same time a green light uh, from D to B because then I'll get a collision. Right, so we need to, so we model this as a graph. So AC, for instance, this vertex AC represents uh, this path from A to C. And I connect it to db if they cross which they do so uh, here's my db here's my ac and there's an edge that connects them All right and then so each of these vertices represents one of the possible paths and in total they represent all the possible paths and then uh, the edges uh, we draw them in whenever um, two of the paths would lead to a collision and then we color it using then this was the this was the coloring that we found uh, during that lecture. Um, is this sort of is this model clear? Is it still clear? This is we're jumping back for quite a while, but uh, is there any questions? Is it making sense? Okay. Uh, we assign colors uh, so such that no pair of connected vertices has the same color. So that's what we did. We colored that graph. That was uh, on the very first uh, very first day. So we colored it with three colors, but is that, is that the chromatic number of that graph? So is that the least number of colors? Could we color it with only two colors, for instance? 
And how, how do we determine that for sure? How do we know what the chromatic number is? How can we prove it? Um, anybody have any ideas? Okay, we're gonna come back to it. We're gonna see uh, something related to cycles. Yeah, that's actually uh, quite perceptive. One of the things we do is we examine the cycles. That's one way we can do it. So um, let's look at some of our, our, our graphs that we've looked at already. So what's the chromatic number of a complete graph? So what's, so this is, K2, right? That's the complete graph on two vertices. How many colors do we need to color that? So we need uh, red, green, we can, this is two colorable. What about, this is K3, it's also C3. So how many colors do we need for this? Yeah, three. So we need at least three because every every uh, vertex is connected to every other vertex. So we can do it with red, green, and blue. What about, let's look at K4 again. So this is everyone, and again, this is a complete graph, so every vertex is connected to every other vertex. So how many colors do we need to for a valid coloring of K4? Four, yeah, exactly. Um, because every vertex is connected to every other one, so each vertex must have its own unique color. So whatever, if I have K11, I need how many colors? Yeah, 11 colors. At least, well, you need exactly 11 colors because you can't have more than that because you only have 11 vertices. So whatever your, the, the number of your complete graph, that's also the chromatic number. We know it. It's both the, uh, sort of an upper and lower bound on that. That's when we say that uh, we know that you can't have any more because you, we don't have enough vertices. And you know, we know that you can't have any less because everybody's connected to every other vertex. So each vertex needs its own unique color. So that gives us a, an upper and lower bound. <laughs> Uh, what about the bipartite graph? So that's, we have our two sets of vertices. And we have edges uh, between them. So this is, uh, yeah, some bipartite graph. This is vertex at V1, V2. So how many colors would we need to color this particular graph? <laughs> two, yeah. We could easily do two because we know that uh, say in V1, no two vertices in V1 can be connected by an edge, and the same is true for V2. So we can actually color every vertex in V1 with one color, and every vertex in V2 with another color. So a bipartite graph, and we can add as many edges as we want, that um, doesn't change the fact that no two vertices in V2 are connected. So a uh, bipartite graph is two colorable. All right, and so it it has a if I say a chi of a, a bipartite graph. Is two as long as it's connected. Uh, what's the chromatic number of a cycle graph? So let's look at. So this is C3. Uh, we've already seen that this is uh, three. Uh, the chromatic number is three. So let's say, or three colorable, which is, three colorable is not the same as chromatic number. Um, I'm sort of using them interchangeably and maybe I shouldn't. Um, three colors, colorable means we can use three colors. Uh, it's not the minimum, but it uh, is actually uh, the, Chi of C3 is equal to three. <clears throat> um, what about uh, C4? Uh, 
Two, yeah. So I can say, do this guy red, this guy green, and then this guy red, and then this guy green again. And uh, so this is two colorable. So uh, G of C4 equals two. Um, what about C5? Three, yeah. So if I have, uh, so I can just start at red and go around the cycle. So green and keep alternating, red, green. Uh, but now I have this, this guy here and I have one green neighbor and one red neighbor. Uh, so I need at least one more color. Uh, so uh, the chromatic number of C5 is three. So is that, uh, are you guys picking up the pattern? What about C6? Two, yeah, C6 is two. And in fact, any, uh, let me see here. Any even numbered cycle graph. has a chromatic number of two. And each odd numbered cycle graph has a chromatic number of three. And it's sort of easy. I mean, any odd numbered cycle graph sort of follows the same pattern as C5 and every even numbered uh, one. Well, you can just alternate. What about uh, C4? Is C4 a bipartite graph? Is it? So the definition of bipartite is we can, uh, you know, sort of divide the vertices into two different sets, um, V1 and V2, where, uh, you know, Every edge is between uh, one of the vertices in V1 and one of the vertices in V2. So what if I said, uh, yeah. So if I had numbered these one, two, three, four, and then I said V1 is one and three, and V2 is uh, two and four. Yeah, so then uh, actually any even numbered cycle graph is actually a bipartite graph. Because um, I can actually divide it into um, two sets where, uh, so any even, let's say I did one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, for V1, I take every second vertex, oops. That should be V1. And for V2, I take every other vertex. So any even numbered cycle graph is actually bipartite. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, any even numbered cycle graph is, is, uh, has a chromatic number of two, and that's the same as a bipartite graph, which is actually uh, consistent. So uh, what about the chromatic number of a wheel graph? So this is a little less useful, but uh, still let's, uh, how did we define this? So the textbook defines it one way and then the notes define it the other. I think we define this as W4. Uh, so what's the chromatic number there? <clears throat> yeah, it's four. This is actually equal to K4. So this is the complete graph. Uh, but in general, we can, you know, if we had W7, let's say, so we have uh, a cycle of six vertices, and then we have one guy in the middle that's connected to everybody. 
Uh, what's the chromatic number of, uh, of W7? Three, yeah. So the cycle graph has a chromatic number of two, and then I have this one vertex in the middle that needs, say, a red. And these could go green, blue, green, blue, green, blue, et cetera. Uh, so this is three. Um, and if I had W8, uh, I'm not going to draw it, but I would have then an odd numbered cycle on the outside, which we know needs three colors, <clears throat> and then one vertex, which is connected to every other vertex, which always needs its own color. Uh, so W8 uh, has a chromatic number of four. Um, so wheel graphs are like cycle graphs, but uh, you always need that one additional color. Um, so that brings us back to, uh, uh, actually, first of all, any questions? Okay. So that brings us back then to how do we know that the chromatic number is three or, or do we know that the chromatic number is three? How could we prove that the chromatic number is three? Well, we know that uh, we need at most three colors. How do we know that? Well, how we know that is because we actually found a three coloring. Right, so we found a valid three coloring using three colors. So we know we need at most three colors. So now we need to prove we need at least three colors. So how, how might we do that? Given all the things that we've We've just seen about, uh, right? We've seen that, uh, for instance, a wheel graph has a subgraph of the cycle graph. So, however many colors we need for the wheel graph, wheel graph, we know we need at least as many as that cycle graph needs. Yeah. So there's a three cycle in this graph, and in fact, there's a there's a few three cycles. So let's say we take. Uh, yeah, I don't like that. Let's take um, we have a three cycle. So we know that we need um, at least three colors as well. Um, because we have K3 as a subgraph. Right, K3 or C3 or what have you. So that way, so now we know actually that the chromatic number of this graph is three because we know it, we need at least three colors and we found a valid coloring that uses three colors. So we also know that we, we need at most three colors, right? So we can prove in general, um, if we wanna find the chromatic number of a graph, first of all, to find the upper bound, we're going to find a valid coloring. Um, and then to find the lower bound, uh, we're going to find a subgraph that requires at least that many colors. So uh, to show this, yeah, missed. Um, we need and upper bound and lower bound on the number of colors. Um, if you want to find, so the question is, are we allowed to say the upper bound is the number of vertices or do we need to find something better? The upper bound is the number of vertices. Um, but to find the chromatic number, the, uh, 
the, the upper bound and lower bound must match, right? So for, uh, But yeah, you are you are correct in the sense that uh, the number of vertices is a valid upper bound. And I believe uh, so. There is a, a graph coloring uh, question on assignment three. So that's uh, is it assignment three? Uh, I don't remember. It's been a while. I've had. Uh, it was a little bit of a relaxing two weeks, I guess. <laughs> um, all right. So any questions on coloring? So I'm gonna add these, uh, I'm gonna add a neater version of all this to the notes and then, uh, like I said, I was having some, uh, I was having some trouble printing this off. Uh, there's some bug, I don't know. It wouldn't, it wouldn't convert this to a PDF. So I just have to work that out and then I will add it to the class notes. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, so Sean brings up a good point. Uh, coloring is used on the world map. In fact, uh, yeah, basically nearly any map uses coloring. Um, since you want, you don't want two adjacent, so if I draw a region and I divide it into subregions like provinces, um, I don't want to have two adjacent provinces to be the same color. So. I want, uh, and then I can put red over here, and then maybe I can put green over here. So yeah, so we can color this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so if we have a map, we can, in this case, this map, I can color it with three colors. Uh, but in general, this coloring problem extends to, uh, extends to maps. Okay, any other questions or comments? All right, I'm not sure. Let me, uh, I'm gonna start models of computation and I think that's as far as we'll go tonight. Uh, this is very short though. It's just, um, it's an introduction. Uh, yeah, let's, let's do that and then let's stop uh, after that. Um, And I'll even review it next class, but uh, it, it'll be good to get a look at it. Oh, is that right? Used to f uh, for finding tumors and x-rays. Do you want to say something about that? Or I, I have no idea what that is. Yeah, so if um, <clears throat> some of you may take in fourth year, third year, it's fourth year, computer vision. And one of the things they do in computer vision is they may look at, um, they take an x-ray and they actually try to find anomalies within the x-ray, looking at boundaries and stuff. And one of the things they do is this type of color colorization to find tumors or irregularities, irre regularities, irregularities, irregularities yeah. <laughs> within, uh, within, within the x-ray itself. Uh, so this is one of the ones, one way we do this using artificial intelligence to come up and determine uh, tumors with an x-ray. Cool. Yeah. Wow. That, uh, I didn't know that. That's awesome. Um, okay. What, uh, okay. So models of computation, uh, All right, so we'll go into this. This is sort of an introduction to the next topic, basically, and I'll review it next class. So it's not, uh, it's very short, and then uh, we'll call it an evening. Uh, so models of computation. Um, so now we're gonna start analyzing algorithms. Uh, so we need to define what an algorithm is. Um, so an algorithm is a finite sequence of unambiguous instructions. Um, and what do we mean by unambiguous? Well, we mean that can be expressed or modeled discreetly. Uh, basically, it's never, uh, the instructions are never uncertain. We always know exactly what we're doing. <clears throat> um, so algorithms are not necessarily restricted to computers, although that's basically the most common um, 
common thing to uh, to talk about when we talk about algorithms is algorithms on a computer. Um, I think I opened the wrong version of this. Anyway, um, so the example of an instruction on a, a computer is given a state or value x to form instruction y. And that's really uh, everything that a computer does. Uh, reads from memory based on that value, it writes something to memory. That's essentially what computers do. Um, and we want to analyze how good an algorithm is and how do we define good. Well, if, uh, if you go further in computers and you take theory of computation, you'll realize that the set of solvable problems is the same for every computer. So basically, every computer you have, your phone and your laptop and uh, some supercomputer has the same power. Maybe not quantum computers, but every computer has the same the, the set of problems it can solve is the same. Um, so when we talk about a computer's power, we're really talking about speed. The question is, how fast can it solve them? That's the difference between, uh, you know, my crappy old phone that, uh, that died on me recently and, uh, you know, my nice new phone. <clears throat> um, and this, this concept extends to algorithms. So a good algorithm is a fast algorithm, right? When we're talking about... Uh, good in terms of computers, we almost always mean fast <clears throat> and correct. Um, but how do we measure the speed of an algorithm? All right. So we can code up the algorithm and time the performance. However, um, you know, use a stopwatch. There's there's lots of little subroutines you can use. However, the speed could reflect uh, the size of the input or the hardware that you're running on, um, or you know, maybe if uh, your phone company is slowing down the phones that you're using. <clears throat> uh, so we want a, a way to measure algorithm efficiency independent of problem size and hardware. Um, so how we do that is we choose some operations. So some operations are typically faster than others and generally you know what those are. So if we add using registers, um, uh, it's faster than RAM access. So these are, we're talking about relative speeds now. So on a supercomputer, it might be, you know, I might access RAM really quickly, but you know, on my phone, if I if I do a, a computation using a register, yeah, uh, that's faster than accessing RAM. And uh, uh, Sean mentioned something about GPUs, uh, so they have a, their own speed as well. I'm not sure how fast they are in comparison, though. Um, but they're, they're fast at the they're very good at what they do. But that's for you're basically multi-threading in, in a GPU. Uh, RAM access is faster than disk access, etc. So we know the relative speed of these things. Um, so we can sort of uh, use uh, ah, neural networks. Yeah, GPUs are used in neural networks. Yeah, that's uh, we're uh, well. That, that that might be a little bit of a side. <laughs> we might be veering a little bit here. Um, so uh, we know the relative speed of these operations, so we can sort of pick a fundamental or representative operation or a category of operations. And we want the worst case. So oft often we take the slowest of all frequently occurring operations. Basically, we want whatever operation is the slowest, uh, whatever is going to form the bottleneck in our algorithm. And generally speaking, uh, yeah, and then we determine the number of times this operation will occur for a given problem size. Uh, yeah, so a model of computation is then select a fundamental operation, which is usually the bottleneck, and determine how many times this operation occurs for a given problem size. And we usually express this using the variable n. <clears throat> um, so many algorithms have a somewhat obvious fundamental operation. Um, Do I want to get into this? Um, you know what? I might present this. Uh, I might leave this for next week. Um, that way I can present it all together and, uh, and you get a better sense of the big picture. This is sort of a, a good logical stopping point. Or actually, the end of graph theory is probably a better logical stopping point. But that's, 
Yeah, so that's uh, that's as far as we'll go tonight because otherwise we're going to land uh, partway through something complicated and uh, and at the end of the night and it's not really a good place to be starting uh, next week. Okay, so um, I'll be here for another ten minutes or so. Is there any questions before we uh, before we end this? At any rate, I'll be here for another ten minutes or so, so you can ask me questions. Um, and yeah, that's it for tonight.